Welcome back, Cat from Scratch, episode 16. Topic today is Delaney triangulation. Uh, we're going to stick with 2D planar triangulation that's unconstrained in this video. We will expand that in the next video. What is triangulation? It's going from a point cloud to a set of triangles like this. And Delaney triangulation keeps these triangles uh, at a very good aspect ratio, so you don't get these thin slivers that you would in other triangulation methods. And in this video, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to implement pretty much the work done by Sloan here. He has a bunch of papers on this topic. You can look them all up. They're all open access. And one good thing about Sloan is that he also includes the Fortran routines in the appendix, so you can just check that out if you ever get stuck. Question, why bother with this triangulation method? Well, it's very good to mesh faces with this. So if you're doing finite elements or finite volumes, this is a great way to make very well, you know, shaped elements on those faces. It's good for rendering. If you recall, OpenGL and other rendering engines render triangles. So you need, if you need triangles, you can do so with this algorithm. It's good for contouring and topography. Let's say you were on a hike with your phone and you were recording sort of uh, GPS coordinates and your altitude and you got home you could very easily use this algorithm to create sort of a, a terrain map of where you were. Path planning, a similar idea, and also a bunch of weird math stuff that I have no idea about. Now, one question is, what about video seven in the series? We talked about triangulation. Well, in that video, we talked about ear clipping. That's a very efficient way to create a triangulation from a boundary of a polygon. Um, it's very fast. One problem, though, is that it's somewhat challenging to handle interior nodes and holes, which we have to be able to handle in a future video. Um, and you can do it with that algorithm, but it becomes very complex and unwieldy, and it's not worth the effort if you can just do this for a similar amount of effort. Um, it's just a better way to handle the problem. And then more importantly, the triangle quality, when you're cutting off these convex faces, convex uh, you know, triangles using ear clipping, you end up with a bunch of weird like slivery triangles like this that are not are not very good so this algorithm gives you much better triangles and what we're going to talk about today focuses a lot on this condition basically you have to evaluate whether or not a given point is inside the triangle the circle that sort of circumscribes every other triangle so Imagine you had triangle V1, V2, V3, and you drew a circle through those vertices. That circle would contain point P. And so this would fail that condition. You don't want any points to fall within the circle that goes through any other triangle vertices in your point set. And also, by the way, V3 falls in the triangle for you know these three points too. So it fails on both, both fronts. However, if you swap the diagonal here from V1, V2, vertically to one um, from P to V3 horizontally, and you draw the circles around those new triangles, you see that no point falls inside another triangle's circle. So this passes a condition, this fails. And the way the whole algorithm works is basically you're gonna add points to the domain and constantly keep checking if this is satisfied everywhere where things changed, basically. So algorithm, so this is one of those things where the algorithm is super simple when you when you hear about it, and then when you implement it, it's really hard. <laughs> a lot of small things that you don't think about come up. And then after you're done, it's easy again because, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. I mean, those things were so small, no big deal. So, you know, I've been through the whole process. I know that it's like up and down. So the top level algorithm that I'm just gonna talk about top level is basically you create a big triangle that contains your entire point set. When I say big, I mean humongous, like a hundred times larger than the dimension of your point set. Then you add in your points one by one, you know, to that point set and add triangles as you go. And you answer a couple questions for each of those points. You ask, what triangle are we in? Obviously the first point is in your big triangle, but after you add in 10, 20, 30 points and create triangles, you don't know what triangle you're in. You could be in triangle 16 or in triangle 45. You have no idea. So you figure that out. Once you figure that out, you break that triangle into three that are attached to your point that you just added. So imagine you found that 
point D that you're adding is inside triangle ABC. What you do is you break triangle ABC into these triangles DAB, DCA, and DBC. And one important thing that you know you're probably going to gloss over because I'm just saying it, but it's very important. And if you make a mistake like I did, it will take you hours to debug. You want to make sure that for every triangle that you're adding, that D is the first vertex in your structure because that will help you stay organized about adjacencies to these triangles as you propagate through the model. So keep in mind that you want to keep D at the front of this list. <laughs> Pro tip. Uh, and then step C here, you're basically going to swap edges to make sure that Delaney condition is not violated anywhere. And remember, you have to propagate out. So for example, if you just if you're adding in D to triangle A, B, and C, you're also checking, um, you know, triangles adjacent to this as well. And you know, if you know this violates your condition between this triangle, you may have to swap here or swap here, right? With with this diagonal, right? You you not you have to be able to figure out which diagonal does not does not fail that condition between, you know, between. Uh, this diagonal and this diagonal and this diagonal and this diagonal and this or whatever right? this diagonal and this diagonal you have to be sure which diagonal is is better for your condition once you finish that you're done you basically finish the entire algorithm however you still have the giant triangle that surrounds your point set so you just get rid of that and then you're done so in more detail uh, there are two optional steps that sloan recommends that are very good from performance perspectives. The first one improves your precision more than anything. Basically, you, um, you it's optional, but you basically scale your point cloud from whatever it is to between zero, zero and one, one. Uh, and so it's not just making sure that, you know, you have Y min, Y max, X min, X max, you know, equal to zero and one. That's not correct. So you want to also be able to preserve your relative lengths along both axes because this condition uses a circle to determine, you know, if you pass or fail, not an ellipse. So you have to be able to preserve your X and Y dimensions, you know, the scaling of them. So um, don't map between zero and one, map just between the maximum of the two dimensions, make that zero to one, and let the other one just fall out, whatever it happens to be, you know, maybe it's zero to 0 0.8 or something, I don't know. And map that into, you know, zero, zero to one, one. This will help us with a later step and also helps us get better precision um, later on. Step B, another optional step, is to sort your points by their proximity. This will severely help you speed up your algorithm if you have many, many points, many, many triangles. It doesn't matter so much if you have like, you know, small amounts of triangles, but you know, it it, it still will, it, 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 it's, it will be noticeable at that level as well. Basically what you do that Sloan recommends is you cut up your domain into this grid shape and you start numbering your points, as opposed to having this point be zero, this point be one, this point be two, this point be three. Instead, you basically number your points in a sequence following a continuous you know, trace through that grid. And it could also be you know, a spiral or something. You don't, have to, you don't have to keep you know, a weird grid shape, thing like that. You can do this. But you want to be able to number things like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. That will make it so when we're looking for triangles later on, we can find them very closely uh, to where we just did an operation um, previously. So that's how this works. And then it's an optional step, just like this one. Step C, the first required step is make your big triangle. So if you map between zero and one, like, like I recommended, um, this triangle should go between, I don't know, these coordinates. That's a good idea. That's what Sloan recommends. Um, and this will be your first triangle for your algorithm. Step D is to loop through all your points that you want to add. So be it 10 points or 1,000 points. Loop through them all and find the triangle that contains them. We did this many times in previous videos. I don't want to spend too much time talking about it now. But you can compute the normals um, of your triangle of interest and then compute sort of the dot products of you know all of these vectors with those normals. And if they're all the same sign, basically you're inside a the triangle if not then you're not inside the triangle one important thing though that you 
you have to know this. I didn't know this. It took me many hours to debug. Um, the algorithm that we're talking about today, it considers a point in the triangle if it's anywhere inside, obviously, but also anywhere on the boundary. So um, S1, S2, S3, either all with the same sign or two with the same sign and one with zero or within a tolerance. So you, you can tolerate one of these to be zero and the other two to have the same sign as well. Okay, step D2, this is part of that step. Um, it's the optional triangle search step. So, you know, if we're just looking through triangles in a loop, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, and you have a thousand triangles, that might take forever. Because if you're on the thousandth triangle and you have to loop through all those ones and constantly evaluate this, that's extremely expensive of an operation. So one clever way that they mention that we can do this is to basically compute the dot product of basically, say you're looking for point P and you guess triangle, you know, like this triangle right here, for example, what you do is you take the dot product of all the edges, outward normals, you know, and the vector from this triangle to point P. If those are, you know, positive, you go in that direction. So you basically go from this triangle to this triangle, and you can basically keep repeating that process until you get to where you are. So you'll always be moving towards the correct solution, not just guessing randomly, you know, you might just guess a bunch of random, random triangles over and over until you get there. That's a very slow method. Uh, what, Sloan re what Sloan recommends is obviously much uh, much more efficient. Now step E, this one is pretty much the, you know, the heavy lifting of the actual algorithm is checking that condition. You can read the paper. He has a lot of, you know, equations in there. Uh, he basically boils it down to evaluating the condition in these, you know, four, four and a half steps. Um, this handles a bunch of the numerical problems that you may have when you have very, very wide or shallow angles for your uh, triangles. You may have a triangle like this. This this sort of sorts those out very well. So we're going to implement these um, equations here. So x1, x3, x2, those basically refer to... Um, the coordinates of points of, uh, of adjacent triangles. I'll talk about that in a second, but just keep in mind that there are equations to solve this and you can look at Sloan's paper to see how they work. So that's how you check the condition. Um, basically the condition will tell you whether or not you have to swap diagonals or not. Because if you recall, the whole point of the algorithm is to pick between this diagonal here and this diagonal here. So basically swap means you're currently bad, try to be good. And no swap means you're currently good, don't worry about it. So that's what this swap uh, indicates. Now where the condition fails, you have to swap diagonals. And this is where a lot of people recommend having these fancy data structures about adjacencies and stuff. Personally, I think you can just do it with, with simple arrays um, have one array that carries which vertices are part of which triangle, and then have one array that indicates what triangles are adjacent to your current uh, to each triangle that you're talking about. So um, that's that's what you have to basically have for structures to make this work. Um, so basically, if you want to add point P, and you find out that um, for the triangle that you've you determined that you're inside. The adjacent triangle has these points v1, v2, and v3. You can, uh, you basically have to check if you have a swap that indicates that you have to basically move from this red diagonal to the screen diagonal, and you have to update obviously all these triangles. So triangle L is the triangle that you just created. Triangle R is one that was uh, opposite it that was already in the model. And then triangles A, B, and C are triangles that are adjacent to these that, that are going to change adjacencies if you change from red to green. So you have to be able to not just keep track of the vertex ordering for these you know, triangles L and triangles R that you're dealing with directly, but you also have to keep track of the adjacencies of triangles A, B, and C that are just you know, going along for the ride. And then here's uh, a very important thing, step G. On triangles A, B, and C, you very well, by doing what you did, you know, here, you may have broken delaneyness of this uh, triangle, A, B, and C, for example. 
So you have to basically keep swapping diagonals and, and repeat steps F and G until your stack of triangles that you're adding is empty. And Sloan recommends actually using a, a, you know, a stack for this, and we will do that in our implementation, but uh, there may be other ways to handle this as well. Then step H, as we talked about before, is to just straight up delete your big triangle. And then uh, step I is to map back from your 0, 0 to 1, 1 to your original domain. So that's the, that's the full algorithm um, described a very, very top level perspective. So now I'm going to talk about the actual code. And so let's just check the header file first. So only two functions required for this. I think Sloan puts like a whole bunch of Fortran functions, but you can do them all in two functions here. One of them is, uh, well, well, only one that you see here in the header file, this uh, triangulate function. You basically pass in a set of points and this is your point set basically, and this is your number of points in the set. So we're talking in two dimensions here, so only only two floats in uh, in that dimension. Now I'll open up the uh, the main main dot c just so you can see the test cases I'm going to run. I have two test cases here. We're passing in a set of nine points like this in in uh, in two D. We're passing them into the the function like this, and test case number two passing in seven points like this. Um, the only difference is test case one is a very simple one just to make sure everything works. Test case two is a, is a pretty much, um, it's a more challenging because it has a bunch of collinear points, including points that are collinear with the super triangle, the very big triangle. And so this, if this works, everything will work. Um, so we'll test both, both those out. So let's open up the actual implementation here. Here you can see the actual two functions that, that we are talking about. The first function is um, this Boolean function, which is called planar point within triangle. This basically evaluates, um, uh, or let's see, it evaluates this condition here. If a point P is inside, you know, A1, B1, C1, very simple. We had this many times before. However, one key difference is that um, the condition for a point being in the triangle or not, it can all be negative, right? Because we, we have a counterclockwise um, winding for each triangle, or you may have w two of them be negative and one of those values be below a tolerance. So that basically means that you can have a point on the edge of the triangle, not just inside. Both of them are, are valid conditions for a point to be considered inside the triangle that you're talking about. So that's this function. Now into the actual function for the triangulation, um, here it is. So the first thing here is uh, we have to find the min and max boundaries of the, of the point cloud. So that correlates with uh, finding these values, x min, x max, y min, and y max. Very simple, you're just looping through. Then we, we remap everything and we preserve that aspect ratio to between zero, zero, and one, one. So we just map this, find largest dimension, in, in this way and scale by that to get everything between those two uh, those two points. That's basically doing this operation here. Next up here is step B, just to use that bin sort that Sloan recommends. So we implement that right in this way. Basically we calculate P and Q. P and Q are the, L, the IDs of the row and the column that we are in in this uh, domain here. Then we use insertion sort to figure out um, basically which points belong in which sequence in terms of the, the, the bin order like this. So very simple. You can read the code to see what's going on if you'd like. Next step here, uh, step C is to make the big triangle. So simply put right here, we're basically, we're, um, we have this, let me talk about the actual um, arrays we have here. So the first array I'm talking about right now is this points array. So points is basically a um, array of all the data points that we have. It's actually passed in to this to this function, so it has the x and y coordinates of everything in the in the structure. And so we basically we fill the first three vertices with uh, negative one hundred, negative one hundred, etc. And we're incrementing the number of points in our structure here by three. So at this point, if we passed in nine points, now we'd have twelve points, right? The first nine being the points of the actual cloud, the last three being points of our super triangle. 
Now we have to make these data structures here. So I have one structure for vertices and one structure for the triangle adjacencies. Basically, the vertices array just encodes which vertices are part of which triangle. And the last, um, the second array here, triangles, basically uh, encodes which triangles are adjacent to the current one, counting in the same direction as you would for the vertices. So the first triangle we have here is triangle, you know, I guess uh, 10, 11, 12, or whatever it would be, based off however many points you're passing in. This is the super triangle. And you see negative one, negative one, negative one. Negative one basically means that uh, there is no adjacent triangle. So this basically means that you're on the boundary of, of space. Obviously, once you're sort of in the point set, you won't have negative ones. You'll have actual numbers here. But when you have no other triangles out there, the answer is just negative one. So next step here is to loop through points and you know add them one by one and check which triangle that they're in. So this here, this loop into II iterates through every point that's not in the super triangle. And then it uh, this loop here, this while loop, basically looks for uh, what triangle are we in. And the first guess for triangle that we're in here is the last triangle that we created. This is also uh, a technique that Sloan recommends for efficiency, is to always check if the previous triangle contains the point that you want to add now. Because because we added the points in, uh, in this way, that is actually pretty likely that the triangle that you just added includes the next point. So we, we start with that off at the previous triangle. And then we have this function here. Um, I won't get into the function yet. I just want to talk about this actual while loop. So this while loop um, is, is what we are using to continue until we've found the triangle that we're actually inside. So to find that we're triangle that we're actually inside, we have to evaluate another um, condition here. Here's where that other function comes in that we just created, planar point within triangle. Here we're passing in the point of interest that we're trying to add and the vertices of the triangle that we're guessing that, that, that the point is inside. So um, that basically runs you know, this code from before that I just talked about. No problem there. Um, at that point, it does a couple things. So the first thing it does is it, let's see, where is it? Here, it, um, it deletes triangle ABC and it adds in these triangles DAB, DCA, and DBC. That's the first thing it does. That's right here. All of this, and it creates the adjacencies as they should be. And then also, it updates adjacencies of the triangles that are nearby. So recall there are triangles that are adjacent to this. That you have to also be able to update adjacencies for because you're adding new triangles here. So this is a new triangle, this is a new triangle, this is a new triangle. Well, not necessarily because you may be keeping one of them the same as the old one, just changing the, the nodes on that triangle. But anyway, long story short, you just have to check the adjacencies of all these triangles to make sure they still make sense. That's something that you have to do on your own. I can't talk about that. I'll be here for 10 hours. You have to just go through and make sure deliberately and you know, very closely pay attention to make sure that every triangle added in has the exactly correct adjacencies and come up with the, the algorithms you have to have to make that work properly. So that's all fine. At that point, this stack comes into play. So if I scroll down to the stack part, basically, um, this, this sort of step F and step G are the stack relevant steps. So basically the way it works is if you have a triangle with an adjacency that you're affecting by your swap from this vertical diagonal to this horizontal, this horizontal diagonal, you have to be able to check if that adjacency is messed up in any way um, in terms of its passing of the condition. Of, of, uh, of this condition here. So you basically add triangles to the stack that have a potential adjacency problem for this condition, and you loop through and check all of those. And that may propagate out quite a bit. You may propagate from this point to this point, to this triangle, to this triangle, as you go further and further away from you know that point. You have to constantly keep checking until no more points have, a, have, a, have an issue. So that's what this uh, loop through stack does. 
Um, I won't get into it except for the part that's right here about talking about the circumcircle thing. Here is where you're, you're again checking the condition. Um, it's called step E. Here's where you're checking if that actually works. So in reality, step E, F, and G are all sort of steps that have to occur on triangles that are on the stack. And so you have to do that. And then uh, lastly, once you're out of that entire loop, you basically have to uh, renumber your triangles uh, in the proper order and you have to get rid of anything to do with the big triangle vertices because again, you don't care about these points here. All you care about is the points inside. So get rid of all these uh, points and also these points will have triangles off of them. Remember, you know, a bunch of triangles will be touching these points. So you have to be able to get rid of all those triangles and then renumber the triangles based off having removed all these triangles. So you do that. And then at the very end, you undo your mapping. And finally, uh, you plot everything out. Um, so that's how the code works. So compile and uh, run. Here's the results. Don't worry about these actual uh, values. Just know that it works um, as implemented. And I will show you a, a visual of how this works using Octave. So the first set of data points here is shown. This is test case number one. You can see these data points all around here. And there's nothing special looking data points. They're between negative six and six in X and between negative four and seven in Y or something. And there's nothing that's collinear about them. They're just a generic set of points. When you plug in these triangle vertices and these point cloud values into you know a function in Octave that plots everything and you, you run it, you'll get this triangulation. And if you look, any triangle that's drawn here and you if if you were to draw a circle through the vertices, it would contain no other triangles points. So this passes that uh, Delaney condition. The next test was this test case two here. Now this one it had a couple points of interest. So if you see, you know, it actually has less points. It only has seven actual vertices versus nine in the previous test. However, this vertex here, this vertex here. This vertex here are all collinear. Not only that, but when you add in the super triangle, that super triangle point is further along this line way, way up. So there's actually four collinear points and that's like a, a really hard uh, condition to, to solve with this algorithm. So basically, if, if this works here, it'll work with any sort of uh, test case. If we add the triangulation in, it looks like this. And again, if you draw a circle through any and all of these uh, triangle vertices, it will contain no other triangles vertex. And that's the condition for the algorithm that we just used. So at the end of the day, long story short, half hour video, um, we came up with a way to implement the Delaney triangulation algorithm in a very sort of efficient way. We didn't have to use a bunch of weird data structures. We did it with just uh, simple arrays using malloc and realloc. Uh, repeatedly and the algorithm is not that complex it's but it's uh, there's a lot of small little details here and there that if you don't get perfectly right <laughs> it won't work perfectly right I took many many hours over the past couple days debugging these small things like a, a single triangle was off and I didn't know why anyway um, just if you want to implement this just take your time and go through step by step by step making sure every single triangle that you're adding is exactly what it's supposed to be uh, and then you'll have no problem. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day.